Good evening and welcome to the Robert Schumann Center. I'm Eric Jones and I'm director and professor here uh, at the Schumann Center and at the European University Institute. Um, it's my distinct pleasure this evening uh, to introduce <clears throat> William Drozdjak, uh, who's going to talk to us about uh, Emmanuel Macron and the future of Europe. Now, William Bill came to Europe originally uh, to be a basketball player. Uh, and, and so his first trip as a professional basketball player was here to Italy, uh, which is, I think, why he came back again. Uh, but, but, but since his professional basketball career ended, uh, he was a time correspondent uh, in the Middle East for five years during the Iranian Revolution. Uh, he joined the Washington Post and spent 20 years rising to the role of foreign editor. I first became familiar with his work because of his extensive coverage uh, in the International Herald Tribune. Uh, he left the Washington Post. He went and founded the Brussels office uh, of the German Marshall Fund. Uh, he spent a decade as the president of the American Commission on Germany, Committee on Germany. Is that correct? American Council on Germany. American Council uh, on Germany. Uh, and, and, and since then, he's, he's been writing books like the book upon which this talk uh, is based. Uh, having said that, it's very rare to see a professional basketball player evolve to the point uh, where he is right now, uh, because at the end of this week, he's going to go to Paris to receive, uh, to receive the, the Légion d'honneur uh, and, and get promoted uh, as, as a Chevalier uh, of France. So I think this is a really remarkable achievement. Uh, and, and along the way, he's written a number of brilliant and insightful books uh, on what's going on in Europe. This most recent one, as I mentioned, being about Emmanuel Macron. Uh, but the book that he's working on at the moment is about the future of the transatlantic relationship. And so with any luck, we'll get some insights both from the last book uh, and the one to follow. Uh, that said, I hope you'll please join me in, in welcoming William Drosiak. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, thank you so much for coming to see us. Uh, thank you very much, Eric, and it's a pleasure to be back here at the Schumann Center. Um, I was here a few years ago to talk about my book, uh, Fractured Continent, Europe's Crisis, and uh, the Fate of the West, in which I sort of did a tour d'horizon of, of the key capitals around Europe at the time when uh, there was an immigration crisis, and, uh, and uh, as well as the aftermath of the 2014 incursion by Russian forces into Ukraine. But uh, when uh, I started this, uh, this book, because I was captivated by Emmanuel Macron being 39 year old neophyte who had never been uh, elected to pu uh, public office before via uh, becoming president of mm -hmm. France. And through mutual friends, we struck up a rapport and I decided to chronicle his, the first term of his presidency. What I found intriguing when we sat down and talked of me being a, um, an American journalist and we conducted our conversations in French uh, that he really wanted to talk about uh, the world outside. And I remember he, uh, he asked me what was the most profound event in your life? Uh, as a journalist, and I said, well, I had to be the, when I was there in Berlin at, for the fall of the Berlin Wall in 1989, and how that was a hinge moment in history, and how it changed. And I asked him, uh, he's 30 years younger than me. I said, well, what do you think three decades now will have been a transformative experience? And, and at the time, he said, I think it'll be the most, uh, the transformation of Africa. And uh, that's why he was interested in building a bridge. Well, I'll get to his vision of the world uh, a bit later, but I want to begin now with the sort of looking at the, um, the uh, topsy-turvy situation in terms of the new geopolitical landscape um, um, uh, three weeks into uh, Russia's war against Ukraine. Um, and I'll start with the um, the arrival of the Biden administration in um, January of last year. At the time, many of you here in Europe probably uh, sensed the great relief in European capitals uh, that greeted the uh, Biden administration. Here was a president who had spent much of his life as a politician, senator, um, devoted to uh, building up the transatlantic relationship. And so after the turmoil of the Trump years, they saw that uh, 
they felt and hoped that uh, the Biden administration uh, would, would usher in a new golden era of uh, transatlantic uh, partnership. But I think uh, what they misread, what Europeans and even American experts who anticipated this misread was that uh, Biden was determined um, to uh, make good on, on uh, uh, his pred uh, pred uh, President Obama's promise to pivot toward Asia. It was you could tell this by the way that many empires were built up within the National Security Council. Uh, they brought in Kurt Campbell, who's a very uh, powerful um, um, policymaker and uh, one half of the premier uh, power couple in Washington. His wife, uh, Leo, uh, uh, Leo Brainerd, is the deputy chair of, uh, of the Federal Reserve. Uh, but Kurt is uh, a very practiced uh, 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 sort of in the black arts of uh, diplomacy. And he set about building up an ember. He established a very strong team um, for Indo-Pacific policy, 26 members in his, uh, his team. The Europe team headed by Amanda Sloat, my former colleague at Brookings had only two. So that sort of ten showed you where the, um, uh, the priorities of the Biden administration. Um, and then uh, during the course of last year, I think there was great disillusionment that set in in European capitals uh, following the, the, the lack of sufficient consultation over the sudden withdrawal of Afghan from Afghanistan. That's what mm -hmm. European forces who were there in Lurch. And, so, and then followed by uh, the debacle over the AUKUS affair, in which uh, French uh, government really felt stabbed in the back of that uh, the, the submarine deal that had been concluded several years earlier by President Macron and his government, which was going to bring in about 50 billion euros over the years with uh, in the, the deal with uh, in providing submarines to Australia. That was uh, uh, sabotaged and uh, the Australians shifted uh, to uh, the Americans as their main supplier. And it, was, it came particularly as a, an insult uh, to the French who were, uh, and, and one of my conversations with Macron was about what can Europe do to help the United States in its, its shifting its focus to Asia. And France is really the only European country with a significant presence in uh, the Indo-Pacific. They have five bases um, in, um, from Djibouti uh, to uh, uh, Polynesia, New Caledonia. Um, they also have 2 million of their compatriots, their citizens living in French Polynesia. So they really had a presence, uh, sustained presence that could have benefited uh, the, the American policy turn uh, toward Asia. And in fact, they were talking at, at Macron had suggested to Biden that maybe uh, France could become a member of the Quad uh, uh, that, would, uh, that would help set um, uh, policy in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and at the time, the concern in Europe, and I was just starting research on my book um, that my next book project, which was going to deal with the, the fate of the transatlantic relationship. And at the time it looked like the alliance was eroding fast, not just because of the, uh, the uh, deception over uh, Afghanistan, but the fear among Euro Europeans that if um, um, the United States shifted its resources and attention to uh, to Asia, Europe was not yet prepared to take over the full burden of responsibility for European uh, security. And at the same time, they would be expected by the American administration and also the American public um, to contribute uh, in a significant way to what Americans saw as an existential threat in the rise of China. Um, so it was this, this concern that 
Europe would would fall short um, in helping the United States deal with uh, the rise of China, in particular because Germany, um, uh, certainly under uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel, had made it clear that they put their trade relationship ahead of any kind of uh, security concern um, with uh, with China, and the the American press was full of converse, of talk last year about uh, when will China attack Taiwan and what will be the consequences? And if we impose sanctions, will the Europeans go ahead and join us? And if not, then that will be the time to really tell the Europeans, well, forget it. You're, you wouldn't support us uh, uh, in uh, dealing with the Chinese and we're gonna let you deal with this on your own. Well, all of that thinking of course has vanished um, in, um, the last three weeks as uh, America's and the world's attention has turned uh, toward Russia's uh, aggression in the Ukraine. And it was interesting, Eric and I were talking before we started about how uh, the perceptions uh, persist, the difference in perceptions persisted for uh, quite a number of, uh, of months. I would say um, American, uh, the American administration started releasing classified information that showed uh, uh, that they, they were alarmed by the prospect of uh, a full-on Russian invasion as early as last uh, December, uh, whereas many European commentators and politicians continue to believe that this was going to be a bluff on, um, on uh, Putin's part. And I asked a uh, senior administration official, well, when did you change your minds on this? And they, they said it was the visit to Moscow in early December by CIA director uh, Bill Burns, who um, more than just being CIA director, he's one of our most uh, experienced hands uh, on Russia policy, speaks fluent Russian, <clears throat> served as ambassador to Russia um, uh, previously during the Putin years and had a personal re uh, relationship with him. And indeed he went, when he came back from that meeting, um, when he, he saw Putin in Moscow and reported, he said, he's going in. And uh, everybody, a lot of the experts were shocked to hear this. But then they, um, later on in December and early January, what really convinced them that war was imminent was the, uh, um, the, the fact that uh, Russian forces were moving field hospitals and blood banks to the front line. And from my days as a war correspondent, I recall, well, that's when you know that uh, that war is imminent uh, because you don't do that when you're just bluffing. So here we are three weeks into this war um, and we don't really know, anybody, nobody knows uh, where this and when this is going to end and how it's going to end. Nonetheless, uh, I think everybody is gratified to see that the Alliance has, uh, has uh, become reinvigorated that, uh, that the European Union, uh, as well as uh, different European governments have been working in cohesion uh, with the Biden administration in Washington on a very uh, strong set of sanctions <clears throat> that are uh, going to inflict enormous harm on the Russian economy. The problem is that this is not going to be sufficient to uh, persuade Putin to change his behavior. And I think that, uh, that uh, even if we persist in this regard, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be what happens on the ground um, that will determine um, uh, the outcome of this. The, the Ukrainians are putting up heroic resistance and that is uh, likely to strengthen as they receive a more inflow of uh, significant arms from um, from the United States and the allies, uh, but they are still vastly out, uh, uh, outgunned by, by the Russians. And I fear that the worst could happen in the sense that we are likely to see a continuing surge in uh, uh, brutality against civilians um, and, until uh, we get some kind of a clear um, outcome of this. But the devastation of the cities and, uh, and also the, uh, uh, the impact on any hope of restoring the relationship 
with um, between Russia and Ukraine is uh, is going to be, I think, uh, something that it's going to take years, if not generations, uh, to deal with. The other uh, interesting thing, probably more ominous uh, factor in the, the last three weeks is that it's become evident that uh, um, that China, uh, the uh, uh, quasi-alliance between China and Russia uh, could, could take an ominous turn for, um, for Europe and the United States. Um, and as many of you know, uh, uh, Jake Sullivan, uh, the NSC director, was in Rome <clears throat> this week meeting with uh, Chinese uh, foreign minister and uh, talking for seven hours. It doesn't look like it produced much progress. So it, um, it's going to have a profound, uh, if, if China does provide weapons, as uh, is indicated by a uh, uh, according to the administration, that a request has come from, from Russia to provide weapons and economic support. If it does proceed with this sort, this will solidify the rest of the world, or at least the United States and the allies against both China and Russia. And I think this is where, <clears throat> this is the outcome that in my conversation with Emmanuel Macron, he, he feared uh, uh, very much. Um, in fact, he told me uh, when he began meeting with uh, with Putin. In fact, he invited Putin uh, to uh, Versailles as his first state visitor after being elected president. They toured Versailles because he he said he realized Putin wanted to be treated as a czar or a successor to the czars, um, and continued these dialogues about history and relationship. He said, "My intention." And even though he was advised against investing too much into this relationship by his foreign ministry, um, he said it was important because um, we need to uh, uh, persuade Putin that Russia needs to uh, turn back toward the West and away from the arms of, of China. And I said, well, what convinces you that he will really do this? And he said, because I'm convinced he will do it because he's the son of St. Petersburg. Uh, which has always been a Western looking city. Uh, but I said, well, isn't he rather a son of the KGB? Um, and it maybe has a different perspective. Uh, and Macron was not committal about this. He says, no, I still have to persist in trying to persuade Putin that um, the future prosperity success of Russia lies in um, dealing with the West because he's said, look, if uh, he told Putin, if you regard the, your strategic challenges, the biggest threat you fa threats you face are from the East and the South. You've got Islamic uh, uh, radicalism in the South that uh, you dealt with by destroying Chechnya and Grozny, uh, but that will come back to haunt you. And you've got uh, population incursions in the Eastern part of uh, Siberia as the Chinese population moves into areas that are left undefended by the, the uh, Russian forces. Uh, he said, this is no time for you to pick a fight uh, with the West. And uh, Putin uh, clearly felt otherwise. He th thinks the only way to rally his people behind him and his unsuccessful time in government because he has not produced uh, the prosperity for his people that he promised. The only way to rally them has been to, uh, to try and gather um, uh, uh, animosity toward the West and use the significant uh, uh, propaganda tools at his disposal as the, as a, the uh, totalitarian leader of, of Russia. Uh, to <clears throat> delude the uh, the Russian people, just as he's doing now with uh, the war in Ukraine uh, and convincing uh, those who watch Russian television see that or are told that uh, it's uh, this war, uh, this aggression or this technical operation, as he calls it, is being conducted in order to uh, deal with neo Nazis uh, and um, the um, the aggression of uh, the Ukrainians. And to 
everyone's amazement. Uh, many Russians, particularly older ones, are are persuaded by this this argument. Um, so they, uh, what is uh, Europe's approach now um, in dealing with Ukraine? I think Macron um, has uh, continued to uh, insist on dialogue. He said. Uh, we, uh, those of us who, who can speak with Putin, are obliged to uh, try to convince him that uh, what the reality is, because he is so isolated that it's unclear he's getting um, any information um, that, that, um, that reflects the true nature of the, of the crisis. And so since the war began three weeks ago, uh, Macron's I'm told has, has spoken at least 15 times with, uh, with Putin. Uh, they'll be speaking again um, this week. I hope to hear more. I'm going to have a brief meeting with uh, Macron on Friday. Um, but uh, he insists that this is um, something that he and Olaf Scholz, uh, the new German chancellor, um, are uh, convinced is, even if they don't make any clear progress in terms of persuading Putin to abandon the war uh, and accept a ceasefire, uh, they need to keep pushing ahead because this is the only um, uh, source of outside dialogue uh, that, uh, that uh, can be achieved. But nonetheless, there are signs that uh, he says that Russia, that Putin is getting um, uh, the message. And that has happened in terms of uh, Europe's behavior, uh, most uh, strikingly in Germany with the new government uh, consisting of Greens, pa the former pacifist party, and um, the free market liberals in addition to the social, uh, uh, Schultz's social democrats with uh, the new German government uh, uh, stepping up uh, uh, military spending with a new uh, fund of $100 billion dollars um, meeting their 2% commitment to NATO, um, um, sending um, uh, defensive weapons to, uh, to Ukraine, and, and also in, uh, uh, aiding and abetting other allies to do the same. Um, and they're also taking, Germany is taking in a significant number of uh, refugees, as is Poland, uh, Romania, and, and Hungary. So this has been in this respect, uh, uh, this has been a great response, far exceeding expectations uh, by the uh, <clears throat> member states of the European Union. But nonetheless, we don't seem to be getting anywhere closer to some kind of an agreement. Uh, at some point, we will. Uh, we uh, one can only hope that uh, both sides exhaust themselves and that before the, all of Ukraine is destroyed. Um, and I think there's, that's where a longer term strategy um, will be called into question because in one of my conversations with Macron, he said that uh, we, will, we in Europe will only have lasting security when we can uh, establish some kind of a strategic, uh, a strategic partnership uh, with Russia. That doesn't mean to replace the partnership with the United States, because he says that still will remain um, the primary uh, relationship for the European Union. But um, we need to somehow deal with Russia's grievances in a way that will um, enable the, um, uh, the entire continent to, to live in a more peaceful and, uh, and stable security order. So what would that look at look like? Uh, of course, it's very hard to predict at this stage. Um, but I think if we can get uh, through the um, somehow find a way to toward a ceasefire and the uh, uh, slow withdrawal of uh, Russian forces, we could then um, look toward some kind of a Helsinki 2.0 uh, conference. This has been uh, advocated by um, Russian experts in the United States, like Mike McFall at Stanford University, um, and others in the administration are also looking at this uh, seriously, because we need to look beyond uh, the war and find out what kind of a Europe will be um, 
uh, can we construct after this? Because the devastation to not just on the ground, but also to the existing um, security order is going to be such that uh, that we need to find a, a new way to rebuild that uh, um, uh, that order in in Europe. Uh, so it will have to include some kind of a, uh, uh, a new kind of relationship uh, between NATO, uh, the EU, and uh, Russia, not to mention Ukraine and other countries uh, left out, such, uh, um, such as Moldova and Georgia. Um, and, and this is, again, it may be wishful thinking, but uh, as Macron told me, he says we have no other choice but to, uh, to pursue this, uh, this path. Um, we have to find a way to get Russia to turn back toward the West. He, he says he persists in telling Putin, he says, your fate, uh, if you want to achieve a, a historic role, um, like the other great uh, leaders in, uh, in Russian history, such as Peter the Great, you cannot achieve it by uh, becoming a junior partner to, uh, to a rising China, because that's how you will be, that's how you will be treated. Um, but in the resurgence of uh, great power rivalry that we see today, um, this is uh, something that is very much in uh, Europe's uh, interest uh, to, to persuade Russia to somehow abandon its uh, dalliance with, uh, with uh, China, because the risk is that <clears throat> if Russia and China become closer together, Europe could be isolated um, on the western end of the Eurasian landmass. Um, and any number of historians have said this could be a disastrous situation uh, for Europe. Indeed, Macron talked about to me about the disappearance of the European political project if uh, in this resurgence of great power rivalry, uh, Europe is not capable of standing up and defending its own interests. Um, it will soon find itself picked apart by um, China, Russia, as well as the United States. And uh, soon we would see whatever cohesion there is uh, within the European Union um, 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 just uh, dissipating. And uh, it's interesting during the current political campaign, uh, which by the way, Macron's uh, popularity levels have soared since he started this uh, um, this uh, dialogues in the three week past three weeks uh, dialogue with with Putin. It's not like he's been seen as selling out the West as some um, anti French voices in the American media uh, say. In in France, it's seen as uh, you know at least he's making a valiant effort at trying to uh, um, uh, find a peaceful way out of this this terrible um, uh, tragedy. Um, so I think he's uh, the um, uh, his popularity levels are rising, and he, he the the French people as well are, according to the latest poll, becoming even more profoundly pro-European. For the first time, I think this past week, Le Monde reported the that there is now a strong majority in favor of a European army uh, within France, and this is significant because. With the departure of uh, <clears throat> Britain from the EU, France is really the only significant uh, military power in Europe at this stage and capable of uh, projecting power in different parts of the world, including the Indo-Pacific, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so where do we, uh, how would we construct this kind of Helsinki 2.0? I think the um, uh, again, Macron's view is that we need to show if we are uh, we are pro-Russia, even though we are anti-Putin, and uh, that um, it will be necessary to persuade the Russian people and whoever follows Putin that um, the uh, European Union, as well as the United States, are willing to uh, um, find a way to bring uh, Russia back into the fold. Uh, of uh, to provide well into it, to the fold in terms of providing a helpful and stabilizing 
influence uh, for European security. This was uh, this has now become a feature of um, uh, a, a review of the events 30 years ago that led to NATO enlargement uh, within the in the United States. And there's a heated debate going on among scholars like John Mearsheimer and others who take the view of George Kennan, who at the time said it would be a strategic blunder to expand NATO uh, toward the East because yeah, it would be seen as a, as a mortal threat by future Russian leaders. And it looks like their, their fears have, in their view have been, been realized. But others say that, uh, no, we did the right thing uh, because uh, we could not have left uh, uh, Poland, Hungary, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and the Baltic states in limbo after they had become uh, had newly embraced uh, democracies and uh, imagine what would be their fate uh, if they had not been accepted into NATO. And I think that is the prevailing view, certainly within the administration and even on in uh, in the U.S. Congress among Democrats and Republicans. Uh, so I don't think that the, um, the, the choice of NATO enlargement will be called into question. If anything, it's going to be <clears throat> finding a coherent strategy in dealing with the aftermath of this war. And that's where Europe needs to bring its own voice um, um, to Washington um, and I hope that it will be heard because certainly what I've heard in my conversations with Emmanuel Macron, he is uh, uh, convinced that, that Europe's interests are in America's interests. And it's in America's interest uh, because, uh, to see Europe develop into a stronger, uh, more independent um, uh, global power so that we can be um, uh, relieved of responsibilities on this continent and concentrate on challenges elsewhere because uh, the challenge of China is not going to disappear. So with that, I'll open it up to discussion. Super, thank you so much, Bill. We do have time for questions and comments from the audience. Um, if, you're, if you're in the... Zoom space, uh, you're, you're very welcome to ask a question as well. Please just use the reactions button at the bottom of your screen in order to raise your hand so that we can call on you. Um, and I'm gonna take a first question or comment from Calypso Nicolaitis. Calypso, over to you. Um, thanks. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, William, for sharing with us your analysis, but also your primary conversations with, you know, with Macron. Talk about primary material, you know, when you're a social scientist. And in real time, this is extremely precious. And as well as your understanding of the internal US um, situation, Bill Burns at some point was my colleague at the Kennedy School. And I'm French, so I, um, for my sins, nobody's perfect. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, so I, I just had a series of kind of reactions slash question, um, including because I've got to vote, you know, in the first in the next few weeks. What do I think of, uh, what do we think? All my friends, uh, you know, are very ambivalent about Macron. And I think that's part of your story, although, although, Maybe you're less ambivalent than some of us French, you know, uh, uh, citizens. So a few points. And one is on the current campaign, um, because I, I think that um, you, you explained very well how Macron, you know, was, did and was seen as engaging with, with Putin. Um, and yet he's operated a magical turn in the campaign. That is all of those who spoke about understanding Putin, hearing his concern about, um, uh, about NATO, et cetera, you know, are now kind of put in the naughty corner, you know, whether it's Zemmour on one hand or Mélenchon on the other, you were too Putin friendly and they're twisting around trying to kind of reassert their anti-Putin and say, oh, we distinguish with the war, da, 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 da. Whereas Macron too was kind of there. Uh, 
Uh, and yet he manages to convey, I mean, uh, to convey the sense of the strong leader who now opposes Macron. So, I mean, he was not good at, in, in IR theory, we'd talk about costly signals that are sent to avoid war, you know, in terms of the game of signaling in a pre-war setting. And he, he didn't really read these costly signals as Bill Burns did when he went to Moscow. Not only that, he didn't listen to the Bill Burns of this world, which kind of connects to the transatlantics. So that's one question. I mean, I wonder, a, how you read that, the campaign and this, his capacity to turn around, but also um, his, how he relates to that, or did you talk about this at all? And then in terms of the kind of global, the tensions that you're talking about, the European security architecture, you know, my, when, when I heard him at the European Parliament in his speech, where he really made the big point and he reiterated to you, you know, the next question, so whether, whether we're with Mearsheimer or not, uh, and I've just been having a correspondence with John because we've usually found ourselves on two different sides of the of the of, of the fence on this. But I mean, I think everyone can agree that the turning point of this story was the Bucharest 2008 NATO declaration uh, offering NATO membership to to Ukraine and Georgia. Now that was pre Macron. Fine. But many Europeans try to pedal back or, or insist that, well, this is an offer, it's in theory, it's like in the longest term horizon. Yeah, people understood, and in, including uh, Merkel, that this was not a great idea. Now, Macron arrives in power supposedly right away, and in your con his conversation with you, you know, understanding this frustration of Putin understanding that there was a Putin one and a Putin two, and that the Putin one was much more into building a European security architecture. And that part of what turned him around was that NATO. Now, this is not about blame game. He also became more and more aggressive on his own. <laughs> he didn't even need the pricking from NATO. But then if, if Macron was so good at reading Putin and in this kind of ongoing interaction with him, including in Versailles, um, so, well, you know, giving him the kind of recognition that he was calling for, if we understand his personality and the way you were describing, I mean, Putin's, why not earlier? I mean, Macron's had five years in power with all the ups and downs of applying Minsk or not applying Minsk. And it's uh, everyone knew that, you know, Ukraine wasn't doing very well and the Donbass kept on coming up, etc. So I'm just... I've been wondering about this, you know, now Macron is jumping up and down about Helsinki too, but... What was he doing for five years? Aside from saying that NATO is brain dead, which leads me to my sec in my third question, I think I'm there, um, which is that, um, you know, you were reassuring your European audience that, well, Macron is, is, uh, is actually committed to the transatlantic relation. And of course, you know, US, 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 and all the more with Biden. Um, and I kind of wonder about that. You know, he did say NATO is brain dead, and you could say, well, that was just to wake everybody up, sure. But at the same time, um, his discourse on European defense is, is, you know, ambiguous, let's put it that way, or, I'd or I'm asking, what do you, how do you read? Yes, the European pillar in NATO, but that's like a very old story, and who's ever said the opposite of that? I mean, you know, so how gaullist is Macron in this story? How, and, and even the goal was, of course, we know he wasn't right in the middle there. <laughs> um, he didn't get out of NATO, but only in the command of NATO. So how do you read? And you're, you're an American, yes? Well, I mean, your nationality is American. So I think you can also have a reading um, in, more like in terms of vibes. And I mean, not just geopolitical reading, but here you are an American, he trusts you. I, I you know, only met Macron once, but I think, I mean, I don't know how to read his relationship with, with the Anglo world. I'm told that he also, not only did he want to be in the quad, but what about Five Eyes? That's, that's been a sore spot, including for Macron, you know, mm -hmm. being part of the intelligence in France. Fa France had applied to Five Eyes before Macron came to power under Chirac, and then there was a bit of a mess, right? And then it didn't happen, but he, he resents these things. And then the UK in that story is fascinating because isn't there an ambivalence there too? You know, he really wants the UK to be in Mali with him and, 
you know, lend the Chanukes and all of that. And it was a very important point in the Brexit conversation to always stress, no, 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 strategy is on that side and TCA and trade is on a separate side and we have to have a wall between the two. Um, so that itself is a kind of intention, if not a contradiction, because there's always spillover between different theaters of politics. Mm -hmm. But how do you read his, you know, and with the AUKUS uh, saga, let's put it that way, you know, of course, in a way, it felt like it hurt even more from the UK that the UK had this special relationship uh, translated in hard cash, uh, in 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 the AUKUS, you know, hard cash and 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 hard, you know, military alliance. Then, so how do you see his his sense of where he wants to be in this transatlantic, come but Anglo world? Because of course, of course, you could say that the UK is on the other side of the Atlantic, but that's like. And finally, on China. Um, so you told us the very fascinatingly that you know um, Macron's concern about uh, Russia was also this, the splinter thing, the great bifurcation. That you know we don't want to be. But what about China in this story? What 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 do you think is Macron's, or what did you hear was Macron's sense? Because I think. Personally, as an IR person, I am very concerned by a world that will completely bifurcate, where both China and Russia, it's economic, but it's also the internet, Facebook, and all the rest of it. I, uh, that world really, really, really scares me. And um, I wonder, you know, how much of his thinking about Russia, you know, go, goes, to, um, go, goes to China. Um, and Eric, if you allow me one last point, um, because I'm like a shadow discussant, but not really. It's one of those totally hypocritical stand on my part. Uh, but I realized I had so much to ask you. EU diplomacy. Uh, I mean, here is Macron, the great champion of Europe and the future of Europe. And we need to have our place. And you, you shared that brilliantly with us. But then on the other hand, his whole diplomacy vis-a-vis -vis Putin until a week ago or two weeks or whatever, even not even just after, was very solitary. It's Macron. And of course, all the image of the big table and Macron on one side, Putin on the other. But it's like not like Macron was there with all his European leaders. And, and, and in fact, I think there's a more general thing that vis-a-vis -vis Trump, et cetera, he always had this kind of vertical, solitary, I'm the great leader attitude. But then how do we reconcile this with wanting to build a Europe in the world? I mean, there is a real tension there. When he's obliged, of course, in Iran or whatever, he, you know, there's an institutional setup. He has no choice. But if he has a choice, takes an initiative. His first reflex is not to call Scholz or any, anyone else or, or Draghi or in spite of this big signature of an Italian Europe, sorry, Italian France new treaty. You know, where is Italy in his in this story? Nowhere. Mm -hmm. So to me, that's let's say ambivalent, I, I didn't, didn't, I'm not saying hypocritical, but there is a tension, there are contradictions there. So not that I'm asking you to defend Macron, but right. since you've spent so much time with him, it'd be great to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you, William. Great. Thank you very much. Well, it's a long list of uh, fascinating questions. Just to deal with your last point, because that's the, the quickest response, I think. Um, I think he realized that he was isolating himself and he was generating some skepticism among the other leaders by monopolizing the dialogue with Putin. And that's why he, in the last two or three conversations by telephone, he has brought in Schultz. And I think that suits Macron's purposes of reinforcing the French-German tandem which he's wanted all along. His big frustration was uh, he thought that first day in office, he came to Berlin and wanted to persuade Merkel, let's make a great leap forward in terms of Europe. But given her innate caution and her mercantilist instincts, because she did follow a policy of German economic nationalism, um, she didn't follow him. And that was one of his big frustrations. Was, I've got a long chapter about the difficult relationship between the two. But uh, to start with your issues from the top, it's, uh, it is fascinating to see the, how the campaign has uh, totally morphed. And it, you may recall the early days, it was all about immigration. And uh, 
the, particularly with Zemmour and Le Pen on the far right and Pécresse, uh, all of them were talking only about the threat of, of immigration. And uh, they've been thrown off by the uh, invasion of the war against Ukraine because uh, uh, at least uh, Zemmour and, and Le Pen uh, are seen much more than, uh, than the other, than Pécresse and Macron as being uh, uh, too partial to, uh, to Putin. But I just want to touch on the immigration, why that is such a sensitive issue, because it's going to come back in France. And you may recall what I said earlier when I asked Macron, what will be the biggest transformation in your lifetime? And he said uh, the transformation of the relationship with, with Africa. And he's clearly done a lot of reading. He, he cited several studies and he said, he said within 10 years, we, you think you, we have an immigration problem now. In 10 years, uh, because of drought, uh, climate change, and civil wars, uh, there's going to be a huge inundation of immigrants coming up from the South. He says, look at Chad, and by the year 2030, Lake Chad is going to dry up. There are 10 million people who live day to day on what they fish and get out of uh, Lake Chad. When that dries up, those people are gonna to have to move and they're gonna to have to move right away. And they're not gonna go into Niger or Mali or whatever, they're going to want to move. So this is what, this is why he's very concerned about Europe's lack of preparation for the next big immigration wave, which he fears. Now, of course, it's, we're seeing the wave coming from the East, um, hundreds of thousands of uh, Ukrainians uh, uh, pouring across, but and they've been welcomed, let's face it, uh, probably for racial reasons. Uh, they're more like, you're seen by other Europeans as more like them. Um, you mentioned, uh, yeah, the 2008 was the turning point. Certainly Ukraine, Georgia, the membership action plan is seen as one of the worst uh, policy decisions by NATO ever because it sent all the wrong signals both to Georgia and Ukraine, but also to, uh, to Russia. And I think uh, that's where the Bush administration and Condi Rice uh, bear a large share of the blame because that was their weak compromise. It was Sarkozy and uh, Merkel who were adamantly opposed. They said, don't do this. It's going to needlessly antagonize uh, Putin and Russia. Uh, but they were overruled by uh, the neocons who were uh, dominating the uh, Bush, uh, W. Bush administration. Um, why did he waste so much time? I, I, that's a fair criticism, uh, but I think he was devoted to the sense that of the Normandy format. He thought that this was the best uh, vehicle to, to reach some kind of a peaceful uh, compromise. He said it was violated by both, by both Ukraine and Russia. Uh, but it was an effort by France and Germany, once again, his, his desire to have this tandem at the forefront of European policy, um, having a, a successful peaceful negotiation. But I think uh, it's all come to naught and uh, whatever comes out of, the, uh, uh, out of the war, I don't think the Normandy format is going to be the process um, that's useful uh, in the future. Uh, and then in terms of the U.S., I, I, one thing that does persuade him is the excellent uh, cooperation, uh, military cooperation between France and the United States. If you talk to people in French Defense Forces and um, in uh, the Pentagon, it is really superb. Um, and even I was down in French Polynesia for the Jean d'Arc exercises. And uh, the French naval commander there was speaking almost every day with um, his rear admiral counterpart in Honolulu about uh, the French role in Indo-Pacific. And I think all of them were, were taken aback by this, this, uh, um, the, the clumsy uh, mishandling of the Alcas affair. Um, and that's... Uh, <laughs> go on for a half hour. I got chapter and verse from both the foreign minister and the French ambassador about what happened there. They were particular, the French were particularly aggrieved because uh, 
they initially proposed to the Australians to provide nuclear submarines. Um, and the French have actually make very good nuclear submarines. And they said, this will help you, you know, extend your, um, uh, the reach of these submarines fuel for fuel reasons and that sort of thing. And the Australian government at the time, led by Malcolm Turnbull, said, no, there's, we have an aversion to anything nuclear. Let's go with conventional systems. So at much greater cost and more uh, difficulty for the French, they, they shifted to the conventional. And it's in, you can read Turnbull's uh, uh, memoir about this. It's an interesting section. He just said, you know, uh, we should have taken the French advice and gone nuclear. Well, then in comes his successor, a conservative, Scott Morrison, and um, who jumps into bed with uh, the US on this and then undercuts uh, the United States. And I think it's going to, uh, uh, it's been a huge setback in terms of uh, French American diplomacy. Uh, we'll see if it, uh, it improves over time, but that's, uh, uh, I agree with you, that was, that was terribly mishandled. And Biden himself says so. He was furious at, uh, at Jake Sullivan and <laughs> the way it goes in American, he was pointing the finger at Kurt Campbell. And so he said, well, I was only following orders. So nobody wants to accept the blame uh, for a debacle of this sort. Anyway, I hope I answered most of your questions anyway. Okay, now I have, I, I have two names on my list already, which is, which is Philip, and then we have a question from Zoom. But if anybody else wants to ask a question, just let me know and I'll put you down. Excellent. Philip, Philip, over to you. So uh, thank you for a very uh, interesting talk. So the impression I get is that Macron is very good on problem diagnostics. I'm not so sure what the solutions to the problems are. So he wants to convince Russia to turn back West. And you know, that sounds right, but how you, do you do that? We've tried to do that for 30 years. Of course, you know, NATO enlargement was perhaps an insult, but then, you know, we traded with them. You know, there was partnership for peace. There was technology transfers. Um, they were invited to the G7. You know, it, it is not as if uh, these were uh, 30 years of antagonizing Russia only. So what would we do? do different this time. Uh, second example, uh, you know, immigrants could be coming in in large waves from Africa and European societies are unprepared. I share the diagnostics, but what do you do about this? How do you prepare European societies to take in large uh, waves of immigrants? Final question, you know, right now we have the Biden administration and uh, Europe is somehow under the delusion this could last forever and uh, Trump was a historical mistake. But what would change in the uh, hypothetical case that Trump came back? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, uh, I think your assessment is correct. I think he is. Uh, good on analysis, diagnosis, but uh, pushing through the, you know, the policy solutions, bringing them to reality is, has been beyond his reach. And I think he would admit that. He said, uh, you know, my problem is, you know, I, I put forward these ideas and I get accused of putting too many ideas out there. And so I tell the other leaders, well, if you disagree with them, come forward with your own ideas. Let's debate. Let's let's find the best possible compromise that we can. And he says, and I very rarely hear those ideas from from other leaders. And I think that was one of his major frustrations with with Angela Merkel. Um, when it comes to Russia, the particular, I think what um, what drives Putin is the fact that his kleptocracy has become so deeply ingrained and the corruption 
and his awareness that he, uh, its unpopularity with the Russian people is so much that he can't afford uh, a, 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 an example emerging next door in Ukraine um, that will become more democratic and more prosperous. And what has driven the Ukrainian people and trips that I've made there um, in the past years, like during <clears throat> the Maidan demonstrations, they were motivated, the young people there were motivated by what they saw happen in Poland. And 30 years ago, Poland and Ukraine had more or less the same standard of living. Today, Poland is at least three times richer and more advanced, even though you could question uh, what, the, uh, what the current government has done in terms of damaging its uh, support for rule of law and democracy. Nonetheless, the prosperity that, young, that Poles have is a source of great envy and desire for uh, Ukrainians. And I think for Putin, he saw that as a mortal threat to his rule and he had to put a stop to it one way or the other. Um, on immigrants, yeah, how do you stop it? I think uh, he and Merkel agreed on a policy. They made a half-hearted attempt making several visits down to Africa. We're going to uh, open up uh, the AIDS bigots uh, to African countries and try to improve your economic plight so that young immigrants will be uh, more motivated to stay home and, and, and build up the economy rather than, um, than do it. But then you said, one of the discussions was, uh, well, the best way to build it up, not just in terms of aid, but through trade would be, okay, what do North African countries do uh, well that, that we could use here, such as citrus? Let's bring in more oranges, tangerines, and all that from Morocco and other places that grow this stuff, uh, particularly in wintertime. And they were, there was an immediate halt by both Spain and the Netherlands uh, said, no, no, there's only one week a year in which they can do it. And that's it, because they didn't want to antagonize their own farming lobbies. So this is once again, the case where the powerful domestic and political, politically influential lobbies within the European Union thwart the, the most uh, you know, sensible things to do in terms of trade. So we had a question from Zoom from Tan Weiye, um, who, who says, you know, look, on the one hand, Macron has identified China as a major threat. And yet, on the other hand, Macron has placed a strong emphasis on European strategic autonomy in order to avoid the prospect of having Europe get roped in by the United States in, a, in some kind of combined policy toward China. So is there a contradiction here? Or how would you resolve the apparent tension between those two positions that Macron has taken? Right. Well, I think he laid out, uh, he's been going to uh, China about once a year uh, since becoming president five years ago. And he had, on his first visit to Xi'an, uh, the uh, gateway to the uh, old Silk Road and uh, the start of the Belt and Road Initiative, um, he gave a, a very, interesting speech. And for those of you who are interested in his thoughts on China, touches on a lot of elements of history, but also what he see, where he sees the relationship going. He emphasized the importance of reciprocity. And, um, and this was in, at the time Donald Trump was president of the United States and Trump was starting to take a much harder line on, on trade. And to some extent, um, uh, Macron agreed with him um, that he said, we Europeans have to insist on reciprocity if we're going to get respect uh, from, um, uh, from the Chinese. So this is still a, I think a debate in flux um, in terms of the transatlantic relationship toward uh, China, if there's going to be um, a common front. I've always thought that uh, the only way to, uh, for the West United States and Europe to uh, um, make an effective argument with with China was to 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 um, have a united front, um, and that really hasn't happened because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I think the uh, 
the fear on uh, the part of a lot of Europeans in, in the approach that the Biden administration was taking was too confrontational, that they did not want to be part of um, uh, a, a tougher policy toward China that would in any way uh, jeopardize the, the trading relationship that, uh, that they've, they've, they've had in terms of their exports. And certainly the uh, powerful lobbies such as the German car lobby, uh, which makes the va vast majority of its profits from uh, selling, I mean, a Mercedes sold in China is 200,000 euros instead of 100,000 euros. So they get the lion's share of their profits from, from the, the sales in China, and they certainly don't want to see that hurt. But um, I think that's where um, uh, that's something down the road that in terms of the future relationship between China and the West, <clears throat> there's got to be uh, greater coordination between the US and Europe. Now I have three, three names on my list right now. That's Claudia, Stephanie, and Robin. And if anybody else wants to, to ask something, please do indicate. And for those of you on Zoom, you're welcome to use the reaction button in the lower right-hand part of your screen to, to put your hand up. Uh, but Claudia, over to you. You have to put your microphone on. Yeah, I, I can join in the thanks for a very interesting presentation. And I would like to push still somewhat further on Macron's internal situation. Because to, to me, you seem to have been depicting two, two, two different Macrons. Yeah, there is the external actor. And I also have a lot of sympathies. I really like what he also does about the European Union, et cetera. So I think he really is a, is a visionary statesman in, in that respect. So I fully buy that point. Whereas when I think we look at the internal situation in France, then it's not good and it has not been getting better not during Macron's presidency and neither in the last 20 or 25 years. So there is a huge right-wing extremist potential with Le Pen and Zemmour sort of concurrencing each other. There are usually very low levels of trust. And I can join in in what Calypso said, all my French friends just despise Macron because I say he's, he's, they say he's neoliberal, he's only doing something for the rich, etc. So that means he doesn't have the support of the liberal center left-leaning French academics. So basically, my, that's a bit provocative, but my thesis was, would be, isn't Macron just a French president because he was the best of all the bad alternatives? And what does this do to his um, sort of credibility and to his capaci capacity to externally act as the statesman that, that you were depicting him? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. Well, I, I, let me say, it, yeah, you mentioned uh, yeah, his statesman role. I think what, what attracted me to write this book uh, and have these conversations with him at, at the time, not just the fact that he was this neophyte um, politician taking on the presidency of a major Western country, but also he was clearly the most pro-European French president in post-war era. And that's why I titled the book, The Last President of Europe, which sometimes gets misread. Obviously he's not the last president that Europe will ever have, but I meant that in the sense that he's the last or the only president leader of a major European country that still espouses the ideals and values of Jean Monnet and the founding fathers of uh, the European Union. Um, um, after uh, World War II. And uh, that's really what drives his, uh, the message. I mean, the Sorbonne University speech is really the, lays out his convictions uh, for Europe and why Europe needs to become uh, a leading actor on the world stage. In terms of the internal situation, yeah, I think he's, he would be the first to recognize the, uh, the frustrations that he hasn't been able to achieve all that he wanted to do. He wanted to make France a much more a dynamic country, uh, economically less dependent on the state, wanted to shrink the state, but that hasn't really happened because when the pandemic came, um, the funding and subsidies exploded. And I think France is now back up at the top, maybe 58% of the GDP is provided by state, uh, state funding. Um, 
And then the, the absence of trust that you mentioned um, um, between the people. I mean, that was clearly, he was shocked by the gilet jaune explosion of uh, anger and frustration, the way in which he was vilified and, and physically attacked in several of these. Uh, and his way of dealing with it, I thought was rather courageous, setting out these, uh, uh, the great national debate, going out in public and standing in front of uh, community audiences for up to seven hours and um, uh, submitting himself to abuse and criticism and coming back, trying to justify his role. I haven't seen a politician who was willing to, to do that sort of thing. And it shows is, you know, he had a, he got elected, I think his most uh, uh, appealing message was that I'm neither left nor right. I wanna do what works. And um, that's what he was trying to do. But you're right, he, he failed to establish um, uh, a trust uh, with the electorate. And that still plagues him today. I mean, I think it's partly due to his glacial personality. He's not very warm. He's very, um, uh, clinical and sort of his analysis. Uh, there were several incidents early on, which, you know, he castigated a young teenager who tried to call him Manu. And he said, no, you should address me as Monsieur le President. And, you know, made him look like, uh, you know, he was arrogant and uh, not in touch with the people. And he's not somebody like Jacques Chirac, who loved to go into a bar, have a beer and, uh, and a sandwich and pat everybody on the back. Uh, he lacks that, uh, that aspect. Um, um, and, I, you know, he realized it, but he said, I can't change my human nature and that's how I am. Uh, and I think, uh, well, that's, uh, you know, I think the, 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 the internal frustrations of the French people are such that, uh, you know, that's going to be hard to, uh, to overcome. But I think the other, problem, of course, is the, um, um, uh, the social inequalities, the banlieue and uh, that, uh, that, you know, nobody has managed to, to deal with that effectively. Third and fourth generations who go off to fight in, in Syria and then come back to commit terrorism on, the, on French soil. Um, nobody really has a good solution for that. I mean, he's trying, he spent, several days in Marseille, you know, which is probably one of the toughest areas of trying to understand the, the forces behind this. But, uh, um, you know, I, I give them high marks for trying, but low marks for success. Stephanie? Thank you so much for, for sharing with us all this information. I'm, I'm curious a bit, about a more bird's eye view. I mean, as we said, like Macron is, is sharing with us his European vision in various speeches, et cetera. But what in a way is his vision when it comes to the world in general? Like what in your conversations that you have a feeling like what he thinks makes the world hang together? Because I mean, we have all of these fancy IR theories and see the balance of power, distribution of power, so material might that matters the most. And that helps us understand how, how states act, or it could be institutions, right? And they help us find meeting points and discussions. But from listening to you, I feel like he thinks personal relationships matter a whole big of a deal. And so maybe with this material might in the background or these institutions, but they're kind of almost secondary and that these personal relationships are what drives um, the world and how it hangs together, especially if you're a leader of a relatively powerful country like France. So I'm, I'm curious to see whether whether he actually talked a bit more about this. And then I have two much smaller questions. One is, is the conversation that you have in French or in English? And I'm asking this because I wonder whether he uses, if it's in English, there are certain concepts he uses that maybe don't translate as well into French and how that he translates them. And the second question would be just, um, you said Amanda Sloat had uh, two people working with her in the National Security Council. Has that increased in the recent uh, weeks or is it still two people? Okay. Thank you. Uh, right. Well, um, so what I, what I, I would say, what I distilled from my conversations is 
uh, Macron's approach to uh, in dealing with uh, the rest of the world and other leaders. I think and what, what drives his analysis are, are two factors with the, the accelerating impact of climate change. And so for a 42 year old, 43 year old leader, sorry? 44 now, yeah, that's right. You met him when he was 39, just now, so it's been five years. Um, but he's part of that millennial generation that really is sees climate change as the uh, existential threat to them. And the other thing that drives his analysis is demographics. I mean, he cited, I was struck by how his command of statistics, um, you know, when we talked about Africa and why he feels in, we recounted Fernand Brodel, we'd read his works on history about how the Mediterranean should serve as a bridge between Europe and Africa. But he said, you know, what really drives it is that at the end of the century, one in three human beings will be African. And that the, the, the powerful demographic forces uh, at work will lead Africa to play an important role. We need to address that. And similarly, you know, in terms of, he says, uh, China's problems are going to be driven by demographics with uh, the low birth rate and they're going to get old before they get rich. And the, whoever is in power in 10 or 20 years in China is going to be dealing with uh, the, uh, the impact of a very fast, rapidly aging society. Um, so those two factors. Um, Oh, you mentioned, yeah, we, we conducted, I wanted to do the conversations in French, I mean, uh, and I taped them and listened very closely because he, even though he speaks reasonably good English, his, I wanted to have the nuances of his, his thinking uh, clear. And that was important, I think. Uh, uh, and he's, uh, you know, he's, he, and it, it's important, you know, like the, um, the whole brain dead quote. I mean, Sophie Petter, who's a friend, um, who's the economist uh, reporter in um, in Paris, and she did the interview, and uh, he was saying that mainly because of his frustration with uh, um, uh, the Trump administration did not consult him when they decided to abandon uh, Kurdish forces in eastern Syria, and he said, "What kind of alliance is this that?" the leaders don't even consult. And he said, we had 200 special forces that were imperiled by this decision. And, and, and he said in, the, in that context, you know, this alliance is brain dead, um, uh, suffers from la mort cerebrale, um, you know, if the leaders can't talk. And of course that got blown up saying, oh, he called NATO brain dead. It wasn't, it was in the context of that particular thing. And then, um, Finally, I asked about Amanda and her team. Yeah, I'm sure they, they're they expanding their forces, but this has been one of the real troubles afflicting the Biden administration is the slow process in getting um, senior people confirmed um, to uh, uh, high positions. Uh, uh, Karen Donfried, who is an old friend, is, uh, who is now Assistant Secretary State for European Affairs uh, told me uh, when she finally got confirmed, I guess in September or so, on her first day in the office, she went, walked down the corridor and all of these empty spaces in the offices there on the, the Europe section and, and, and elsewhere still had not, the offices were unoccupied because something like one out of three had barely been confirmed by that time. I, I hope, I think with the renewed emphasis on, on Europe driving policy for the foreseeable future, they're going to bring in some, uh, some very smart and talented people because they're there and they, they, want to, they want to serve their government. Robin? Yeah, thanks very much. I mean, there is one thing that puzzles me a bit. I, I do agree. I mean, we basically seem to agree that diagnosis might have been right uh, from Macron that politically is also smarter than a lot of his opponents. But the fact that the politics was beyond his reach, uh, you said more or less, to me is, is still an alternative explanation is that, that he just failed big time. And I'm, I'm just wondering whether, you know, I mean, typically if I consider two different, uh, I mean, two, two specific cases, 
The first one is on, on Russia, keeping Russia you know, far, I mean, basically closer to the continent has failed. And one of the reasons is also something I cannot really explain to myself is, has he not overestimated the fact that you know, Russia might want to become still a little brother of China? I mean, that, that is somehow, you know, the, the whole, you know, French diplomacy and so on, you said yourself, was against it. There was no necessarily like a reason for trying to really bring back R Russia closer and to kind of send these fake signals. So in a way, wasn't it already like a big, you know, negative step, I'm speaking too much, uh, so to say. Second example of, again, potentially speaking too much is on, you know, he said, you said, you know, he's one of his main goals is to keep your Europe together, you know, the politics, uh, the, the European continent uh, together politically and on defense issues as well. From a domestic French side, I'm not so surprised that the French you know, governments and, and, and people are rather in favor of a European defense. Uh, they have been for a while, since the 60s, it has changed a bit, but I mean, by now, people are rather in favor of it, if only for, you know, industrial reasons, it also makes sense for French economic interests. But he's also managed to antagonize all CE countries by calling NATO you know, brain dead, but also by bringing this kind of idea that if there is a European defense, it's not necessarily going to be keeping Russia away, because precisely it was kind of moving also closer to Russia at the same time. So in a way, he's been also you know, missing the point twice on these two issues. And I wonder whether, you know, I mean, one possible interpretation is, OK, he's good on the politics. Maybe it served him, but he didn't serve anybody else but him. And uh, for sure, not his objective. So uh, yeah, I'd like to have your take. Right. Well, just on um, European, I think uh, he starts from, as other analysts do, from the fact that you know the European Union collectively spends four times as much on defense as Russia does. Um, and why can't it, but there's a lot of duplication and there's maybe not sufficient enough specialization in, in areas where, you know, what, if, if each individual country could be coordinated in such a way that uh, there could be a more sensible uh, European defense uh, uh, arrangement. As I said, I cited that, that poll, which uh, has been in Le Monde and Political for the first time this week, a majority of French voters are in favor of European defense. So I think there's a there's a recognition that the modern challenges are such that uh, no uh, individual country can do it alone. That there's got to be uh, um, more of a of a European solution to this. I mean the same thing on on um, immigrants. I mean Frontex is. Uh, you know, cited as one example, it hasn't been as successful as as it should be because uh, they've got a lot of people that they could bring uh, to bear. But I think there's an awakening that has occurred because of this crisis that I think will make um, politicians more responsive to to the public desire for greater uh, integration of European defense efforts. So I th we'll see how this is, uh, but I think this is a real hinge moment in history for, for the European Union. I mean, Monet used to say, Europe only advances through crises. I mean, this is one of the biggest crises that Europe has faced and, and how it responds, I think will be, uh, will be important. Um, trying to remember your second, uh, you asked me another point. Uh, and it's, it's important perhaps to specify. I, I agree, European defense is a good thing, but it was. Oh. He, may, he may believe European defense is a good thing, and we may have good arguments to believe in it, but the way to do it would have been to get the CE countries on board, Central and Eastern European countries on board. And the way he's basically acted in the last five years has been everything but trying to bring them on board. It's been antagonizing them by yeah. failing to provide a Russian deterrence that actually is what they need. I mean, in the sense of, uh, like, as we see right now. So was it not just a basically poor political judgment to just speak too much, even though that appeared as very clever? And that's, that's really the, the heart of my question. Yeah, no, I think that's right. And it, he's, he's visited these countries. They've had conversations about it, but I think there's a, 
there, until now, there's been a sharp division in terms of Mediterranean countries seeing immigration, illegal immigration as the biggest security threat that they face. Eastern countries see Russian belligerence as, uh, as their threat. I think this war has, again, awakened all of Europe to the fact that uh, you know, they need to do something and some, do something fast in terms of, of a more coherent uh, approach to defense. So we'll see whether uh, the, these countries, uh, Europe becomes complacent once again after this war is over. But, uh, but I think there's a, there's a significant time for action. And if Macron is reelected, as it certainly looks as uh, very probable right now, I think, um, you will see action uh, very quickly in May, uh, as, as soon as he can, because he wants to put the highest priority on this, and he realizes that, uh, that they've got to move fast uh, while the public is with him on this. All right, we have time for just one more question. So I'm gonna hand over to Bridget Laffin for the final question. Bridget? Thank you, and thank you for it. It's been a great book great talk and great discussion. Can I ask you what what you would what Helsinki 2.0 looks like? Because Helsinki one was very simple. It was the post-war settlement, inviolability of borders, and then that third basket on people-to-people -people relations that in the end actually did was contributed to undermining uh, communism in the eastern half of the continent. So it was it was, it was not that complicated. So what what architecture could one now construct? And then what model of political economy matches that? Because you could envisage a situation whereby, okay, Ukraine, no NATO, but it gets a perspective on joining the EU. But of course, as long as Russia is a kleptocracy, then a pro prosperous countries on Russia's border are a very big problem for Russia as long as it continues in this kind of state capture that has clear, is clearly much deeper, I think one of the, perf the performance of the Russian army in the war suggests that that kleptocracy goes very, very deep and has, you have this image of a strong state, but it could be pretty rotten state. Mm -hmm. So again, what, what model of what security architecture can match a political economy architecture that would in some way stabilize this part of the world in terms of the, the relationship between Russia and the countries to its mm -hmm. west? No, thank you. Very good question. I think, um, you know, the Helsinki one approach of the three baskets of concerns, you know, uh, was, uh, is a model that, that could work. I mean, if you, I mean, just thinking off the top of my head now, but I mean, if uh, apart from, you know, security, respect for uh, uh, borders, um, uh, you could have a, a, a basket dealing with energy issues. Um, you know, they, that certainly would be of concern uh, for, uh, you know, to provide stable, uh, sources of energy um, um, from Russia uh, to uh, the West. Um, uh, that could also include uh, nuclear issues. Uh, that would also include climate change, uh, because uh, I think, you know, and more and more even Greens are coming around to this view. If you're really serious about doing something on carbon emissions and uh, impact on climate change, you have to say, uh, uh, come around to an acceptance of nuclear power. Um, and I think there, that will be uh, certainly given the number of nuclear power plants in, in Ukraine that are now imperiled by the, this war, uh, that's going to be an important uh, uh, way to regenerate uh, that, that country. And then of course, uh, then it'll be as it was with Helsinki 1.0, the whole question of human rights um, and, democratic values in a separate basket. And how that gets negotiated, I think really depends on <clears throat> what uh, follows Vladimir Putin. Is it going to be another, you know, a product of the KGB? Was it going to be an Alexei Navalny? I don't know, um, um, somebody of that heroic stature. Um, 
Uh, I think that it's really going to, uh, that uh, I think it will be incumbent on the West to show, if not magnanimity, at least strategic foresight, because when we look back at the last 75 years, the greatest uh, achievement was bringing Germany back a, a defeated wartime enemy back into the mainstream of uh, democracies, uh, same with Japan. Um, and I think we need to find a way to use that example as a way of bringing Russia back into uh, um, uh, the Western community, if that is what. It's going to be a very difficult thing to achieve, but uh, um, the idea of a Helsinki 2.0, it doesn't necessarily have to be that format or that model, but I think that's, that's the, um, the, that's the negotiating uh, template that I would be looking for. Um, on the other hand, you look at the OSCE, that's been a very a big disappointment in terms of a continent-wide uh, organization that's supposed to be in charge of uh, supervising peace. Um, but, uh, you know, for that matter, we might as well uh, uh, reassess Bretton Woods and the WTO and all these other organizations that were set up in the post-war era, but seem to have uh, become, if not obsolete, uh, past their due date. Well, Bill, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid this is all, all the time we have. I mean, having said that, I, I think you've, you've quite rightly put your finger on the fact that this is a revolutionary moment, both for the European project and for the transatlantic relationship. And, and as an often skeptical observer, I, I have to say I'm impressed that the Biden administration seems to have risen to the challenge, at least in the initial handling of this crisis. I'm, I'm even more impressed with the strong display of, of European unity and resolution and the design and imposition and sanctions. So I think, I think there's plenty of reason to be optimistic, but I have to say, it's still early days yet. I don't know what the exit strategy is for Russia from Ukraine or, or, mm -hmm. or, or from us from this conflict. And there are just so many ways that this could go very, very wrong. Uh, and, and with that in mind, I look forward to learning more about your current book, book project. Uh, I, I wish you all the, all the best. Uh, and I hope we can get you to come back and explain us, uh, explain to us what happened uh, once that book is finished, uh, because we certainly learned a lot this time around. Bill, thank you so sure. much for thank coming. Thank you. Thank you.